Good morning. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Rubin Museum and particularly congratulate Carl for a really amazing uh, exhibition and a really wonderful book. I had a chance to plagiarize everything that was in the book for my talk today. So <laughs> everything I learned about empire and faith is comes from the, what's written in the book. And please, you know, uh, get the book. Uh, it's really excellent. And the uh, exhibition yesterday I saw was amazing. And that. Um, I foolishly said, you know, some time ago to say, give the keynote speech. I'm really embarrassed about this because um, then I said yes to give a talk yesterday and suddenly realized I have to prepare two talks <laughs> and it was a really daunting task. And at the end of semester, so marking papers and every student is asking me to get their reference letters in time. So it's really rushed and I didn't even get a chance to print my talk. So I'm going to... Um, talk about faith and empire, and this actually subjects of such interest to me and great. And I will begin with the, uh, 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 the uh, empire faith with the story about the Bangladesh war. Now, you say, what has Bangladesh got to do with the empire and faith? In 1970s, when Bangladesh was founded, China opposed the creation of a Bangladesh state. China was pro-Pakistan and India was liberating Bangladesh and China and the US both opposed the creation of a Bangladesh. And when Bangladesh was formed, China suddenly found outside having no relationship whatsoever with the Bangladesh and they didn't know what to do. But the myth has it, Chong Lai had a brilliant idea. Bangladesh need to create a national hero, which is not have not been appropriated by uh, West Bengal, the people, uh, the Bangladesh in Calcutta, hasn't appropriated, or the Indians, it has to find a national hero. So they did a sort of popular contest of who is the most famous uh, Bengali. Who do you think it was? Atisha. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so the uh, Myth has it that Chung Lai, it's all attributed to Chung Lai, but I don't think it's true. But anyway, they exhumed Atisha's body from a Nyemo and made it as a donation to Bangladesh and created the um, Atisha Memorial Park in Dhaka in Bangladesh. Now, that is the legacy of faith and empire and utilized for present political purposes. Similarly, tell you a story about Nepal and China. In 1970s, the road was completed between um, Tatubani to, from Lhasa, Tatubani to Kathmandu. The name of the road was given Aranako Road. Now, no Nepalese or Chinese ever heard of Aranako. <laughs> Aranako was a, a great naval artist who is said to have been taken to court of Kublai Khan by Sakya Pandita and uh, became one of the great sort of art builders of what's the monu Buddhist monuments in, uh, during the UN period. So here, today, Nepal-China uh, friendship is, uh, um, is marked by all the names of Areneko, Areneko Road, Areneko Friendship, stu Nepal student, uh, Chinese student friendship is called Areneko. And every time Nepalese ambassador is pointed, he visits the statue of Areneko that has been erected in 1980s in um, Beijing. So this is sort of the legacy of empire. Uh, uh, of Buddhism. And when you look at Aranika, it actually has to do a lot with the material culture, what we see in the exhibition here. And Atisha is to do with the faith. And being today, the empires use that to make the connection, link between the different regions in that. And it's the only way in Bangladesh is connected. And when you look at the Chinese embassy and the Bangladesh embassy, uh, uh, websites, they always say that there's a century of connection between the people of China and uh, Bangladesh, and this uh, example is uh, a teacher. Uh, and similarly with Nepal, the example is of Aranako. But both were mediated by Tibetans. 
It is not the Nepali who introduced the uh, Arunaka to uh, UN court. Atisha wasn't introduced uh, uh, through uh, uh, Chinese Buddhism, it was through Tibetan Buddhism, which has cemented that uh, ties. Now, when we talk about empire and faith, it's a sort of, there's a, intellectually, there's a sort of, I find it quite complicated. Is this what we look at in terms of historians in contemporary setting, or how would the uh, Tibetans would have seen it at the time? And uh, when I look at the Tibetan text, actually, we, what is the empire? You know, how was it the empire was seen? And there isn't really a word which describes the term empire. Well, if you look at the empire, empire is sort of often described as sort of multinational uh, empire uh, spanning many lands and nations and incorporating varieties of groups of different languages, different religions. And um, one of the interesting things about the empire dis doesn't really try to uh, create a homogeneous uh, ethnic community. It is uh, one of the main uh, characteristics of empire is the multiplicity of ethnic communities in which uh, it exists. But it has a dominant uh, group, dominant elite, or dominant ethnic group. A group, and this is, it becomes highly contested in contemporary uh, politics. Who is this dominant? In contemporary China, if you look at the Chinese response to the New Qing history, and Chinese resisted that use of term empire in a Chinese context, and Chinese contemporary Chinese, they won't want to see China as a nation state, as always been nation state, not a, a empire. And when Western uh, uh, historians and uh, Qing historians refer to as empire, Chinese tend to uh, get a uh, great anxiety. So why is the sort of term empire is not sort of acceptable to contemporary Chinese uh, uh, elite and thinkers? It's, the response is not just coming from the government, but it comes from Chinese uh, uh, intellectuals also. Um, this is the idea that because empire, the main content of the empire recognizes the diversity and the dominance of a particular elite. Whereas in, when we look at the term faith, it becomes very problematic to me and the context of Tibet. What is faith we're talking about? In, if you look at the Tibetan text, we talk about Buddhism. In fact, in the Tibetan text, particularly during the Qing period, it's never Themba, you know, it's not a Buddhism as per se that is emphasized. In the Tibetan text, if you look at um, Chandra Robert of Namdara and all these uh, things, it's always a particular Buddhist group. It is a Shasir Kitemba, you know, the religion of um, Buddhism of yellow hat. You know, Shasir Ketamba. So the tie here is an emphasis is on a particular sect. So when we look at the Ming, it's during the Kamapa, and when we look at the Yuan, we have the Sakya uh, tradition. So there is a relationship cemented in forms of Tibetan Buddhism. Again, it's not the Buddhism that is uh, emphasized, it is the particular sect that is uh, uh, emphasized in that context. So, Another aspect where you look at the, uh, this relationship, I would say um, it's a very much of an elite and personality-led uh, relationship, empire and state. When we can look at it from the uh, Yuan period, uh, the Satya um, Harak, a close relationship with the Yuan uh, uh, Empress uh, Kublai Khan, and then the Ming with the Kamapa and the uh, Manchus uh, with the um, uh, Giluk. So there's a correlation between particular Tibetan Buddhist uh, uh, sect and uh, particular Chinese uh, dynastic regime. So again, emphasis is not on the Buddhism as such. Uh, it is on a particular uh, Buddhist sect that is uh, ties are built. Other aspect is in where you look at it in terms of, um, of popularity. In some extent, these ties always remained elite ties. For the majority of say Tibetans had no connection of some degree. You can say uh, during the Qing uh, period, the. Um, uh, Manchu's empress was seen as a Chambayang Kongma, the uh, incarnation of uh, Chambayang. But most of the time, actually, most of the Tibetans, uh, I don't think, had any vision of that connection 
of uh, being sort of part of the uh, imperial uh, regime. It is essentially a, a sectarian and it's essentially an elite tie that is um, uh, established between the links with the Tibet. But given that, but in terms of another level of the connection is what I call the material culture, which is the exhibition is all about. That is the creation of the artwork and the product we see in terms of tankas, metalwork, and uh, stupas, and uh, that is in a way, actually, some way displays the penetration of Tibetan Buddhism at a very uh, intimate level in the society in, in that. So when you look at the, um, the white stupa in Beijing, you know, it's a very dominant uh, uh, structural figure in, uh, I mean, pre, Modern uh, China, it's one of the biggest sort of buildings and people visible to everyone to see and it's uh, known. And another aspect is the Wu Tashen, you go there, you cannot really tell where Tibet begins and where uh, China ends. It's uh, the iconographically, it's a uh, very um, integrated, uh, recognized all that. They and similarly, well, one level we can talk about uh, empire as being purely elite. But in the context of Tibet and Mongolia, actually it was not an elite in way, where the Mongols masses were converted into in Buddhism. And um, uh, they practice not just at uh, uh, court, but at homes. And this is where it's a very interesting aspect of I find interesting is when generally when we talk about empire and faith in historiography, there's a two approaches to that um, empire and faith. One is to view as the, uh, um, um, faith as the dominant ideology of the elite who governs that um, um, empire. So you have a Mughal India, the Islam was the, uh, the Turkey, uh, um, this uh, elite who came to rule uh, India. And uh, then we can look and say the more recent sort of British Empire, Christianity being the ideology of the uh, uh, British uh, uh, Empire, and it's sort of uh, cementing the civilization mission of the empire and imperialism is to say uh, you convert everyone to Islam or you convert everyone to Christianity. But in context of Tibetan Buddhism, but Buddhism was, was the alien religion. It wasn't the religion of the empire builder. It wasn't the original religion of the Mongols, nor was it um, the religion of the Manchus in the same extent that Islam is or Christianity is to them. Second way when the empire is, uh, and faith is linked is sort of faith as resistance to imperial rule. You know, empire is resisting uh, uh, imperial rule and um, uh, toppling. And the most common that is sort of cited is, sort of, um, say, rise of Christianity against Roman Empire and overthrow of the collapse of Roman Empire is uh, attributed to rise of Christianity. So resistant uh, to that. But in that context, uh, these two sort of uh, historical narrative, Tibet, that Tibetan Buddhism doesn't really fit because Tibet was the conquered, colonized territory, and it is, Buddhism is the religion of the colonized and not of the colonizer. So in that sense, how was it that Buddhism was able to tame uh, um, these uh, imperial powers? Now, this is a very interesting in the way which Tibetans write about that taming, what I call the taming of the imperial forces, you know, the, whether it's Yuan uh, or the Manchus, where it has tamed. And in Tibetan uh, Namdas, whether you look at the fifth Kamabas or the Sakyas Panditas visit uh, to Yuan court or the uh, fifth Kamabas visit to Ming court and fifth Dalamas, uh, 13 Dalamas visit to the it is always that they were not taken to the emperor center. If the Tibet was the center and they were invited, then they should be. Now they were asked to come. They were in back to come. And the Tibetan resistance, like, you know, Tsongkhapa says, I don't want to come. All this resistance to do that. And um, uh, Kamaba also didn't want to go. So there's a great deal of idea in the superiority that we are superior, therefore we are invited. 
the, in here, the position is reversed. It's the person who's inviting is made uh, inferior, and the people invited is the superior. So this superiority is not only in terms of personality, but translated in terms of majestic so of Buddha Dharma. Buddha Dharma is so majestic, so brilliant, that they, uh, <laughs> why it's been uh, invited. And we can go for on from all the Pandinishis. Uh, Secondly, Tibetan Buddhists always position themselves at center. When you look at the way it's written in uh, sinology and Chinese history, China is the center, Tibetan rest is periphery. But in Tibetan terms, the faith and Buddhism, Tibet was the center. From center, they were going to far places. And in fact, the Tibetan lamas are so worried about traveling to China. And you read this sort of far places, they say, oh my God, this is so hot and it's going to be dirty and we're going to get smallpox and we're going to die there. You know, it's such a horrible place to go. You know, who wants to go there? You know, they don't want to go. It's just such a horrible place to far to go. It's not like everyone trying to immigrate to New York today. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to go because Lhasa was the center. You know, why would someone will go from such a wonderful place to these faraway places? We have no importance. So there is a sense, actually, that we are not going to the imperial center, but actually this is that we are going to the blessing to the periphery. So Tibet was the center, and the empire was a periphery to Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism, and we're going to bless them, and we're going to bestow wisdom to, uh, to the emperor. So in terms of personality, it's a very much one of us seeing that Tibet as a being a center. And this is uh, manifested in bestowing of material culture, art, crafts, all this construction of temples. It is a, this is the sort of majesty of Buddhism, you know, bestowing of a Buddhist uh, uh, treasures. Second aspect where Tibetan looked at, uh, in some, there was a, both the um, brilliance and arrogance of Buddhism and the majesty of Buddhist uh, lamas, but at the same time, there was a pragmatic consideration. When fifth Dalai Lama um, uh, is not in power, you know, he, oh, I've just name skipped it, his, um, uh, one of his attendants goes to Mongol and writes back to fifth Dalai Lama and says, God, we've got to make friends with these are very powerful and rich patents, uh, you know, they could be very useful for us. So, Tibetan lamas need patent, a very rich patent. I would say, in fact, the, what was the material economy of building uh, all the monasteries in Tibet? What was the economic basis of sustaining these uh, huge, enormous monasteries in central Tibet uh, and Kham or even in Labrang? You know, that come from the imperial patronage. The empire gave money to, for constructions of these uh, temples. So Tibetan perspective, it was a, um, one of resources and economy. And uh, we don't have a figure of exact sort of uh, percentage of the donation that came from the Mongols or the Manchus uh, to, to the monastery. But I would suspect, in fact, it is a huge amount of donations came, but in the more recent, in the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century, we have much more clear that when the Buryats and the uh, Kalmuks and um, uh, Mongols came to Lhasa, in fact, they bought enormous amount of uh, gifts and donations, both in terms of gold, silver, material gifts. So this was one of the main sort of, they were very well received because they were main, uh, one of the main funders or donors to uh, them. So, but the Tibetan point of view, the empire was a source of material wealth in which accumulated them. The third fact that the Tibetan uh, will need the m m empire and protection of the, why would they sort of be accepting them? I will say it's protection. Fifth Dalai Lama would never would have gotten into power without the support of the Mongols or later by the Manchu, that the rules of the lamas were maintained because of the cohesive power that uh, uh, empire, uh, imperial powers held. And in that sense, the, it was a very important alliance that uh, uh, was needed for, to maintain the position, particularly during the Qing period and the regimes of Dalai Lama uh, uh, in that. It is uh, Ganten Potang was uh, 
protected by the uh, Mongols in the beginning and then later the Man uh, Manchus. So that is the uh, important aspect that the, for the Lamas and Buddhism, the empire, the Mongols and Manchus provided the cohesive, uh, cohesive uh, power that needed to maintain uh, its rule. Now, in terms of uh, Tibetan, that's why they looked at uh, in terms of uh, priest patent in a very much like um, uh, donor and uh, recipient. The lamas bestowed the blessing and religious wisdom, uh, and well, the uh, layperson donated money. And this is exactly how it was uh, uh, represented. In 1913, at a similar conference, uh, Chinese asserted that in 1904, the reparation to Britain was paid by um, Ch uh, Ch uh, Qing government, not by the Tibetan, and the, the uh, Qing was still paying reparation to the British. And Longchen Shatter said, of course, that is the duty of a sponsor or to Lama, that you know, Qing is a sponsor of the Lama, and that is your duty. The, the, you know, agenda has responsibility to paying the debt of the Lama. That was how it was perceived by the uh, Tibetans. So, in some extent, it's very Tibetan Buddhism is unique in that way. It is not the religion of the empire builder, but the religion of the conquered, but it was able to tame the conquering uh, army. In this sense, yesterday I was making that um, Tibetan but where as a Western imperialism and rise of Western economic power and colonialism completely fractured the sort of confidence of Chinese civilizations and Confucian culture, somehow Tibetan Buddhism, even being conquered numerous times, get, never get fractured because Buddhism always tames the conquering army. And that is, even this day, to Tibetan Buddhism been sort of one level being conquered. The Tibet is as territory has been conquered, but somehow Buddhism has become a global religion. And that reinforces the Tibetan sort of sense of superiority in their own religion. Somehow, religion, Tibetan Buddhism is embraced by Americans, embraced by the uh, contemporary sort of Chinese elite, and it has uh, become global. And that is the certainty that Tibetan religion has. And therefore, in terms of lamas, okay, today the certainty of Tibetan Buddhism is far stronger than it has ever been. One level, we talk about Buddhism as being attacked and declining in Tibet, but in fact, Buddhism has become a global religion as it has been aspired to during the different imperial periods. When the Buddhism during the Yuan period or the Ming or to the Qing has become global in sense of the imperial religion of the time, but today, in the sort of globalized way, the Tibetan Buddhism has translated as a global religion. Okay, thank you. No questions? Yeah. Anyone with questions? Good morning. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. Um, my question may be a little frivolous, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I have read, uh, not deeply, that um, the connection that um, Tibetan Buddhism uh, and the effect that Tibetan Buddhism had on the Mongol Empire was to make them more pacifist. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm wondering if you could say a more uh, say a few words about that. Well, uh, I dare not say anything about the Professor Atwood's in front here. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he, he's, uh, and uh, um, I, I've been to Mongolia s s several times. I didn't find the Mongols passive. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, at the, our uh, ITS Tibetology meeting, one of our <laughs> members got beaten up in a pub. <laughs> so it was, it, it was a pub role. And I was uh, repeatedly w warned in Mongolia, I should not dance with the Mongol girls because they're going to beat you up. So I didn't find them any sort of uh, passive at all. So I, uh, mm, why, you know, this is a sort of a, uh, a popular narrative you find, actually, Tibetan Buddhism attributed the decline of m m Mongol manhood and virility and the decline of Mongol empire. Mm, and there are many factors. I'm not sure whether somehow Buddhism made them pure, complete pacifists and tree huggers. Professor <laughs> 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 Edward will explain later more. So you talked about um, the global spread of Tibetan Buddhism, but you didn't talk about the taming the conquerors today. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you, if you want to talk about a little bit of the place of Tibetan Buddhism in China proper these days. Yeah. I often tell my students, you know, the largest religious yeah. institution in the world is in Kham, right, yeah. Larangar. Oh yes, I mean, today, you know, at UBC, I'm teaching this introduction to Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, um, uh, I have about 120 students, um, about 100 of them are uh, Chinese. Every semester I have this course, there's so much in demand, and almost all of them are Chinese. Mm, and um, in uh, Vancouver, often I feel, I wish I can speak Chinese really well, because I can stop being professors and just be a lama, because there's so <laughs> many. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be much more lucrative. <laughs> because there are so many Chinese asking about Tibetan Buddhism. And you will see, I mean, they built a, a temple in Richmond with the most Chinese. I mean, it's a Tenggur, which is temple, it's a 30 million. And uh, I was showing, I mean, I can show you most strange, like uh, I was asked to organize Gamaba's visit to Canada, and the amount of the money the Chinese sponsors donated is so enormous, and that was sort of like going, My, why can't you endow a chair at UBC, you know? <laughs> It's an incredible act that happened. And then um, popularity of all the Chinese celebrities. There's two ways this is perceived. One is uh, Nivari Chinese looking for spiritual solace, that one thing. But I look at it in a different way, because firstly, I don't see this as some a new phenomenon. But you have to go from the Tang period to the uh, 19, I mean, your book, you know, the uh, Tibetan Buddhism has always been present in Chinese society. It was, it was only sort of, con today we talk about it as being absent, but actually this is what the, uh, uh, the communists, uh, if they had any sort of like sophisticated sort of understanding of history, they would have sort of made Tibetan Buddhism sort of integral part of Chinese and say it's not what they've done, it's made Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetans alien to China and uh, out of Chinese history. That, but uh, I would say contemporary Chinese interests, they are reverting back to earlier period in history. And they might say, what did the rich Chinese do before? You know, what did the rich Chinese do during the Qing period? What did the rich Chinese do during the Ming period? They become patrons of Tibetan lamas, and they invited Tibetan lamas. So now what do the today's billionaire Chinese do? Well, they want to be like the rich Chinese of the Ming period or the Qing period and invite lamas and become a Tibetan Buddhist. So in that sense, I would say they are reverting back to a lost tradition they're looking at. And they see that as their root, not as something they're uh, appropriating today, but it's, it's a much more integral part of Chinese society that is uh, seen. Um, so in that sense, then when I talk to a lot of Chinese, they say, oh, my grandmother was a Buddhist and my family was a Buddhist. They will tell you that family history. There, there's always this historical link. Somehow China is trying to resurrect some of this past link, rather than to look at it as somehow contemporary China as lost in sort of spirituality and now looking for a new sort of religion. I would say this is actually resurrecting the past connection. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> in relation to what you just mentioned in terms of Chinese adopting Tibetan Buddhism in con contemporary society, Xi Jinping tried to synthesize the essence of Tibetan Buddhism today. So how would that place in terms of legitimizing current rule? Mm, it's, you know, it's like synthesizing and all this uh, thing. Every empire, every state tries to control how people should worship. You know, it's, it's, over there. it's not about sinusizing. It's about uh, what I call way of uh, creating code, way people should correct form of worship. You know, they are trying to sort of uh, create that uh, what is perceived as what, uh, because in China there's a very interesting definition which uh, you don't find it anywhere. There's a legitimate religious practice and illegitimate religious practices. You know, that's what the Chinese have. That is, comes from very early on from the 19th century of Chinese development and the, also the translation of religion and superstition. So there's a, there's a very strong idea. Some things are legitimate, some things are illegitimate. So uh, the Xi Jinping's uh, sort of this pretend attempt is uh, the, what they call, what I call is uh, uh, imposing correct forms of worship uh, in that. You know, what is to correct to be Christian? What is to be correct? Even this happens in America and every state. You know, what is a legitimate form of Christian worship? You know, in Texas, people who hold the rattlesnakes and dances, is that correct form of Christian worship? You know, people say, no, that's not correct form of Christian worship. So, but of course, in the United States, it's not enforced particularly. In China, they are trying to enforce something called correct form of worship. I look at that. But that is to also emphasize the um, most important form in uh, this new Xi Jinping is, is the nation before religion. And this is what is very interesting about empire and, um, and faith, is that uh, faith, okay, um, primacy of faith in Tibetan Buddhism is uh, uh, stressed while, as in the contemporary sense, primacy of nation is stress. You know, nation should be, religion should be subservient to a, a nation. Whereas uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism's process of religion is that na is the empire becomes subservient to the uh, Buddhism. Hi, I'm over here, I think. Um, thank you, I really enjoyed the talk. Could, I'm very interested in uh, your point that uh, the sort of translocal empires had so little effect on the local identities. That's, I think, an important point that when throughout history, Tibetans have tended to identify themselves locally and also with local religious identities. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you think, I don't know, the differences between other kinds of empires where you have, I guess, more administrative uh, systems in place that, that are identified with the translocal empire or something as opposed to how, how do you administer an empire without having everyone know that you're doing that in a sense and, and be identified with that? But uh, actually, you know, the empire is it's a very interesting. Uh, I mean, let's say the uh, uh, British Empire, okay. Height of a British Empire in India number of the sort of the white Anglo-Saxons who are ruling India was tiny. It comes into a few thousands. And the multitude of Indians who are ruled by a few thousand white Anglo-Saxons. You know, so it, 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 empire r r r r r relies on the two things. First, on charisma and majestic, and the potential use of coercive power. It can draw on enormous coercive power, but it doesn't have to be all time present in that, even during the British Empire. Britain can draw on huge armed forces. So the Mongols and the Manchus, they all can do the, uh, the similar thing. It's uh, the majesty of the empire and the charisma of the uh, imperial rule that is uh, important to the end. But of course, the, the background, there's always the, the threat of coercive force in that. Uh, as uh, looked, but other aspect in the Tibetan Buddhism and the different empire is, uh, I mean, the, uh, 
uh, when you look at the British Empire, uh, you look at, say, London or England was seen as the center. Uh, and uh, even the Indians begin to go to London. You know, actual number of Tibetans who went to center is a very, very few in that. Some lamas went, but it's not a sort of popular people went on a pilgrimage or something. It was not, uh, wasn't uh, interesting. And um, so it's a, still in Tibetan context, I would say it's remained very much elite. Uh, connection, particularly with, say, the uh, uh, Manchu. But uh, the Mongols, it's different in, in the way it really was integrated. It's become almost inseparable uh, home. Even if I go to Mongolia, I feel really at home. You know, the food is very similar, with the way we dress is very similar. So much is integrated and um, penetrated into each other's culture, the language, everything. Else. But in that sense, the Mongol Empire and the Tibet, it is in really created the sort of, it is very hard to say where's the center and the where's the local in that context. Thank you. We have time for a final question. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you if you could speak a little bit about one dimension of the connection between faith and empire that you haven't touched on yet, which is that of ritual. Yes. So in contrast to, say, the British in India, where, <clears throat> as you point out correctly, I think, there were very few Brits. Uh, actually, they were even mostly Brits. They were mostly Scots and Irish mm. uh, in India. Um, uh, they did not make any use, at least as far as I know, I, I could be wrong, uh, they did not make any use of, say, Hindu rituals in their imperial administration. And that stands, seems to me, in marked contrast to the Qing period, where we know that the Manchus did indeed uh, make uh, active use of Tibetan ritual in different parts of their administration, both civil and religious and military. And Buddhist rituals, uh, the invocation of certain Buddhist deities, were a big part of the sending off of armies or the return of armies. Uh, and you know, there were, as as Pat Berger here is, has has written about, um, you know, plenty of examples of very conscious identification of particular particular deities and particular manifestations in particular contexts which were thought to help to give power, a kind yes. of divine power to Qing armies. And that's not something we see in a lot of empires, but it does seem to be, it, it, I think it maybe complicates a little bit the taming of the conquerors mm -hmm. part, because particularly if we're using Buddhist ritual for military purposes, that's not about taming, that's about deploying, yeah. I would say. I just wondered if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, one thing is that Oh, quite interesting, during, uh, in one of the characteristics, I would say, empire uh, is to maintain economical distance between all religions. It's not really, uh, uh, empires can't afford to privilege one particular religion because it will lead to resistance from another. So um, in, uh, during the sort of uh, Mongol period, uh, and um, of course that, um, Tibetan Buddhism was very much privileged religion in that it was like. And during the Qing period, uh, now this is a much debated issue, how Buddhists were the Qing, you know, it's a discussion. And some people say, well, they were completely Buddhist. Some say, no, they were, the attitude to Buddhism is particularly instrumental, it's not really real. And, but, you know, a, a, and identification of the Qing emperors, that's Chambe Yang Kongma, you know, Manchuri, that is the ritual was played very important. The technology of ritual was very important in both in the Tibetan perspective and in from the Qing and uh, Mongol. See, in reading the, most of the articles, one of the narrative that is given uh, about um, Tibetan Buddhism and the various empires in, in China is often, uh, in most of the writings, say the Buddhism provided a legitimacy um, for each regime that came into power because they were essentially illegitimate regime and uh, acquiring power through uh, a force. So they need legitimacy and Buddhism provided a cosmological framework for rule and things. Second aspect is rich, uh, uh, Buddhism provided the ritual means of governance and it reinforces the, uh, now. One look at, again, ritual aspect is also a very elite connection. 
is not the mass. So to me, this is so quite a problematic. Why do they need Tibetan Buddhism to legitimize? Why can't they use any other uh, form uh, to legitimize? In fact, when you look at the great majority of the populations, Confucianists or Taoists or Chinese, Buddhism, wouldn't it make more sense to have a, a in the eyes of the vast majority of the population that legitimize uh, that? Only way would I would see Buddhism ritual and uh, cosmological flame work and the notion of kingship is relevant is Buddhism is always claimed to be universal religion. It is universal. It's not confined to a particular ethnic group. It is promoted as a universal religion. So that, in a sense, uh, um, uh, very powerful idea of it being universal, not confined to a particular ethnic group, I think is a very important aspect of that. And in that frame, so the, uh, in contemporary sense, we don't believe in the efficacy of ritual, but uh, it, it, people really genuinely believe in the efficacy of ritual. Rituals were powerful. It will work, you know. If you are anointed, it works. If you do rituals to repel your enemy, it works. You know, this is all that has um, uh, been done. So uh, efficacy of ritual technology is uh, very deeply had to believe, and it works. Uh, and uh, how it works is hard to explain. It's the only both the, uh, the one who received that uh, participants will know it's worked or not, not for uh, us to see it's been working or not. Thank you for your questions. Please help me thank Zarin Shakya for the keynote address. Thank you.